So she's here. Uh, the, you just sent me over to. Go yes, courtroom is ready. Courtroom's ready. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. We all ready. Yes. Yes. Thank you. All mobile, mobile devices. Please do so. Thank you. Yes. Just can you, are you not seeing the judges? Are you? No, I just. Can you just knock on the door yeah. so I know that they're ready to come in? Thanks. Your mobile phone's off. Yeah, unless you've got permission from the judges, or you know, on silent. They're on silent. On silent, yes. Because we have to liaise with our clients. Yes, right fair. Yeah. Fair enough. Not on silent. quite trust them to be on silent, that's the trouble with you. <laughs> they do have a mind of their own sometimes. They do have a mind of their own, yes. Please, your lordship, your ladyship. Um, I'm going to start by giving an overview uh, of why we submit this case is significant. Uh, I, I will then, having done that, signpost where I'm going with the remainder of my submissions, and then deal with those different sections in turn. Thank you. Can you give us um, uh, a uh, just a prospectus for the um, for the morning? Have you? I'm sure you have discussed um, timings and so forth. We, we have, my lord. Um, it's proposed that I will speak initially for one and three quarter hours, taking us to 12.15. Yes. Uh, my only friend reply with the same amount of time. Yes. 
uh, taking us, I think, to three, three o'clock, uh, and then half an hour for um, reply by myself. Very well. Thank you very much. Very All right. Um, in, amidst the placid waters of surveyor's negligence claims in respect of defects, it is a long time uh, since the judge's decision about uh, the measure of loss has caused such a disturbance. Uh, with a few ripples in the precise formulation of the measure uh, over the years, and with this court's putting to death um, in 1987 uh, of the notion that a claimant might recover the cost of repairs, the rule has always been to award a diminution in value measure, or as it's sometimes put, an overpayment measure, uh, reflecting the extent to which the property was worth less uh, or the purchaser paid too much uh, because of negligently unreported defects. And the understanding has been that one needs to work out what, if anything, the surveyor negligently failed to identify. Uh, and once one has done that, uh, then uh, the measure of loss is the difference between the value of the property in the condition in which it was reported uh, and the value in the condition in which it should have been reported. Uh, the only complication there is that occasionally a purchaser may pay more than the surveyor advises him to pay, or may pay less. Uh, and the complication is resolved uh, by saying, well, you get the difference between the lower of the price paid and the value in the assumed good condition and the value as it should have been reported. Uh, and that, um, uh, we submit, reflects the um, fundamental fact that this is a transactional loss. The surveyor uh, is advising about a prospective purchase and what is fundamentally at issue uh, is that the buyer needs to know the condition of the property with a view to deciding whether or not to buy and if so what a fair price uh, might be. Uh, and therefore the extent of that overpayment, if any, is the loss that's attributable to the negligent agent, um, the surveyor. That's the loss that he's assuming responsibility to protect the client from. The cost of repairs is often relevant evidentially for the common sense reason uh, that any purchaser of a defective property uh, is likely to want to know what it would cost to put the disrepair right. Um, but the disrepair measure, disrepair is not ex itself um, the measure of loss. Uh, and this, um, we say that cases show, is in accordance with the underlying or fundamental compensatory principle, uh, Livingston and Royards, Foliard, etc. Uh, because if the surveyor had performed his or her contract, uh, then the buyer, the buyer either would not have purchased and would have avoided the overpayment loss in that way, or it is to be assumed that a purchase would have taken place at what the market value in fact was. In other words, it's the market the value. One. Indeed. It's the second one. In the traditional surveyor's case, it, you don't tend to get into whether or not they'd have bought it at all. The understanding is they'd have bought it, but at a lower price. Well, Which is not this case. Uh, my Lord, um, seen through the prism of the South Australia principle, I'm going to come on to that later when I look at the law. Um, that, that approach, we say, is entirely unexceptionable. And indeed, prior to this case, um, no judge that I'm aware of had used the South Australia decision um, to depart from the conventional um, measure of loss. Uh, the diminution in value or overpayment loss is the loss in respect of which the duty was owed. The surveyors providing information, not advice, uh, not guiding the whole transaction and the foreseeable consequence of the information being wrong is that the property will be worth commensurately less or there will be a commensurately large overpayment by reason of the negligently unreported defects. But that all assumes that they would have bought the property it, it, with the defects in it or without the defects in it. If you get a fact finding by the judge at first instance that they would not have bought the property, you're in different territory altogether. Well, my lady, these ca if, if, if the claimants succeed on liability, they will always have established they would not have bought the property as a matter of no. causation. No. No, they won't. That was 
for the purpose of my earlier intervention. It doesn't follow. It doesn't follow in those cases where we're looking straight, pure surveyors' value, uh, negligence cases. The assumption is they would have bought it, but they would have bought it for the lower amount. Um, well, I'm, well, I'm sorry. It, it, that is the alternative possibility. Uh, there would that, have been a that, purchase at a, mean, at a lower amount. Yes. Um, I mean, either way, the claimants, claimants can succeed on causation. In most cases, they're cases that they would not have bought, and that was the um, claimant's case here, of course. Uh, and I mean, the classic case is Watson Murrow is another example. Um, the claimants were buying a second home in Dorset, a wealthy city couple, uh, and they did not want to take on the burden of repair, repairing the property um, because they were too busy and didn't want to spend the additional money on, on repairs. So they wouldn't have purchased. That was their causation case. Um, but we say that the measure of loss remains, in fact, either um, they wouldn't have purchased or they would have purchased at a market value, a correct market value. The measure of loss remains that diminution in value or overpayment loss. Um, um, my Lord, as, as, as you know, the court in this case, the judge in this case, departed from that well-established rule. He expressly departed from Watson Morrow. That's at paragraph 253 of the judgment. Um, he didn't ask what the value of the property would have been if Mr. Large had advised as he should have advised. Um, that is, that there were certain minor defects. There was a big question mark well, about... Well, he deals with that. Yes. Because that wouldn't compensate the hearts for their loss. Indeed. Yes. So he, he did ask himself that, uh, at least as a general question. He didn't put pounds, shillings and pence on it, but he asked himself that as a general question. He, he did, my lord, yes. Um, but um, what I'm suggesting is that um, a conventional approach would have been to ask what the property would have been worth if the surveyor had advised as he should have done. And that on the judge's findings, and obviously we're not at liberty to go behind those findings of fact, and we don't seek to do so, um, that on the judge's findings would have involved the revelation that there were certain, in the judge's words, relatively minor defects that were apparent. And then beyond that, what really mattered in the judge's view um, first, that the damp proofing protection was not visible, uh, and there was a large question mark about whether it was there or effective, because the property was newly reconstructed and there hadn't been sufficient time to see whether or not there was an underlying problem. And secondly, and again in that context, um, that the surveyor, instead of saying that it, um, uh, it would be reasonable to get an architect's certificate to protect you against latent defects, which is what he did say, Secondly, that it sh he should have said it's essential to get it. Now, um, the, the thrust of my submissions is that um, in line with the authorities and in seeking to identify what the relevant diminution in value or overpayment was in this case, what the judge should have done is said, well, what would the value of the property have been if the surveyor had reported as he should have done? And um, one has to, I accept, on the facts of this particular case, uh, um, as it were, zoom out and encompass a little bit more factually than that, because the judge's findings were to the effect that um, the surveyor should have recommended further inquiries about damp proofing. And of course, the architect's certificate as essential. Um, I, I don't want to hamper you in, in developing the, this point, because it's very important. Um, but um, you. You adhere, obviously, to the Livingston principle, yes. which is that the, um, the claimant should be put in the position that he would have been in um, had the contract been performed. But, but you've restated that for the purpose of your submission to say, what would the property have been worth yes. if the defendant had performed his contract? Um, now, those are that those are two quite different things in some cases. Well, they are and they aren't, my lord. I mean, I, I, I submit that the, um, the established measure focuses, it's the transactional loss. You're looking at the point of purchase. But, but the, I, I'm, I'm not, you understand, disagreeing with you for the purpose of yes. the question, um, but I'm trying to understand why the Livingston contractual loss principle should be so limited. Um, simply because we're talking about surveyors. If the reality of the matter is that this, um, these buyers would not have gone forward, um, why, why 
is the loss limited to the, um, the valuation of the property? But be, be, because the scope of the duty and the loss within that scope of the duty is preeminently um, the value of the property at the point of purchase. Okay. So it, if, as in this case, and this, this case, as it were, is a hard anvil upon which these points um, become particularly striking and prominent, um, if you have a property which has latent defects, and this is an unusually difficult property in that sense, obviously, um, then um, the question becomes, um, are you protecting the claimants from the loss that they would have avoided if they'd known what they should have known at the point of purchase, which is my contention, and that would involve valuing the property with, with some very large question marks, but also lots of known unknowns, or, as the judge did, do you pan out to encompass everything which emerges following the purchase, all the very many latent defects that emerged um, down the line following <coughs> the experience of living at the property and intrusive investigations um, prompted by the need to put things right on the litigation. Well, well was merely that obviously the judge held that the claimants were entitled to that um, more expansive measure, embracing all de the defects of the property. And, and we would ask um, the court to note that that was, it didn't matter therefore whether the defects had anything to do with water or damp egress, which was the principal concern that the judge said the surveyor ought to have had. Uh, it didn't matter whether or not a competent surveyor could even have suspected um, specifically defects, some of the defects that it turned out existed at the property. Um, it didn't matter that the form of survey was one which made no promise to identify latent defects. And it didn't matter that Mr. Large had said, um, when advising about a, an architect's certificate, a professional consultant's certificate, um, that if you don't have one of those, you will be unprotected against latent defects. Uh, and the claims knew that. Uh, and they went to their solicitors and said, we don't want to exchange unless we've got the certificate that the, that the surveyor has recommended. Well, we say that that measure was wrong in principle because it doesn't reflect the principles the case law um, contains. Uh, and um, whilst anyone would have a lot of sympathy for the claimants in this situation, it's also unfair to the surveyor. Um, he was treated as the insurer of the condition of the property, uh, as if he'd given a warranty. Uh, and the diminution in value figure that the judge arrived at of three quarters of a million pounds um, uh, was arrived at on the basis that that's um, uh, reflecting the slightly higher cost of £800,000 that would be incurred in demolishing this property uh, and rebuilding it, which would have catered for all sorts of defects, have, having nothing to do with anything that the surveyor could have spotted at the outset or even suspected at the outset. Well, I'm going to try and convince you that, that the judge was wrong to um, embrace such an expansive measure uh, and that um, there was, in fact, an, an orthodox uh, measure of loss that the court could and should have adopted um, in line with submissions at trial, uh, which would do justice to both parties uh, and take an intermediate route uh, in this case. And to do that, I'm going to structure my submissions as follows, if I may. Um, first, I'm going to direct your, uh, uh, the, the court to some particular factual features of the case and holdings um, of the judge, um, which we contend are important when identifying how the measure of loss should be formulated. Then I'm going to take um, um, the court to the, to the law, uh, which bears on that question. Uh, then I will confront what the judge held the measure of loss was and why he said that was the correct measure. And I'll try and explain why we contend he got that wrong. Uh, and finally, I will outline um, what, if you do apply the correct legal principles, we contend uh, the measure should be uh, and why the respondent's contentions are uh, mistaken. So, well, ultimately, if, starting I can with some factual matters and holdings by the judge, uh, and I emphasise again that um, uh, we recognise that those findings of fact and holdings are not um, uh, an issue on this appeal. They are a given. Uh, but they are material to the question of what the scope of the duty was and, in turn, the measure uh, of loss. Um, scope if, of the duty is not part of the appeal. It's the measure of loss. Is. The scope of the duty is not. My lord, my lord, yes. I accept, I accept. I'm, I'm <coughs> simply, simply using that in shorthand for the, for, the, um, for the measure question. I should have put it as the measure. Yeah. 
Um, um, well, as many, can, can we start with a supplementary bundle? If I could take um, the court to one or two um, particular documents. Not the judgment. Sorry. Not the judgment. This My one. heading was the judgment. You said we would look at the judgment for his finding. I'm going to look at some particular, some primary documents first of all, and then go to the judgment. No doubt the court will have picked up from its pre-reading what the property was like, but you see obviously there um, the Savile's particulars uh, and the very exposed condition, uh, or the, the position of the property, sitting on top of a cliff, um, looking out over a very nice um, bay down um, in Kingsbridge, um, Devon. And if one wants to see how it looked a little closer up, um, if one turns to page 53, Uh, one can see over the next few pages um, some photos taken by uh, Mr. Large in the course of his um, survey. So one gets a sense of the, um, as it were, the newness of the rebuild. The, the practical completion had been about a year before um, the survey took place, so it's a, a relatively new um, physical structure in large part. Um, In terms of the survey that was actually undertaken, um, obviously it's a home buyer survey. Can I just direct the court's attention, please, to page 24 of this bundle? Uh, one gets quite a useful um, summary of the different kinds of survey that are available. Uh, and as one would expect, there is a relatively rudimentary condition report. Um, reporting on the condition only with no valuation. Then there's the home buyer report, um, which um, again reporting on the condition, um, but also incorporating an opinion on market value uh, and a list of any problems that may affect the value of the property. Um, issues that need to be investigated and legal issues that need to be addressed before completing your conveyancing. And then you get the building survey, which is obviously a much more extensive inquisition, as it were, into the state of a property and an, and an analysis of the state of a property. Um, so far as the home buyer service um, is concerned, um, it's um, obviously the case that, um, uh, well, it is the case that that does not um, purport to give a, as it were, an omniscient view of the condition of the property. And one can see that. If one can turn to page 11. The judge dealt with all of this. Um, and he compared it because there was a point, should there have been a building survey? And he concluded it didn't matter. It's a very careful and very thoughtful judgment. I understand you yes. say he got the measure of loss wrong. Yes, indeed. And that's what we're interested in. But it's all got to be within the four corners of the judgment. Okay. So, so um, speaking for myself, I, I mean, I'm happy to look at these documents. You've got a relatively limited time. I'm anxious that we focus on the things that matter to Apologies. the appeal. I, I, I'm, I'm grateful. Can I, can I just, for, your, for the court's note there, page 11, uh, paragraph 2.4 of the um, practice note from the RICS about this form of survey. Um, I, I only mention that because it demonstrates that the focus of the service is on assessing the general condition of the main elements of the property uh, and evaluating features that affect its present value and may affect its future resale. Um, yeah. Not exhaustive inspection, no tests are undertaken, a risk that defects may not be, certain defects may not be found. Well, all of this was quite understandably lifted into the judgment. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, now, um, I mean, as reflected in that, and, and again, um, uh, I'm sure it's self-evident that the, the surveyor is obviously not the lawyer, and in, in the conventional property purchase, obviously surveyor and lawyer will be working alongside and hopefully in a complementary fashion. Um, but there will be, um, there, the, the idea is that the um, surveyor may have a responsibility to identify matters which are material to the lawyer. And if I could just refer your lordship's lordship to page 42, again in the practice note, um, one can see that reflected in commentary on part of the task, uh, which is um, where, where one sees at the top of page 42, um, legal advisors are responsible for checking relevant documents, um, um, but um, uh, it, one goes on to read of various things that the surveyor can do as it were, teeing up questions for the solicitor to advise about.
<coughs> so um, when, when we look at the report, obviously one of the main criticisms of Mr. Large, the judge made, was that when he was dealing with damp proofing in relation to the, to the, to the walls of the property, and the relevant sections are in my um, supplemental skeleton, um, in effect, he said, um, there doesn't appear to be any problem. Um, there are no sign of defects or deficiencies. Um, but that's as far as he went. And he took on trust that those protections were in place. And obviously, the judge's criticism was uh, that wasn't good enough. Uh, and with a new property where they hadn't been exposed to the weather for long enough, um, Mr. Large ought to have counseled um, further investigations uh, and checking. Can I take your lordships, my lady, to page 84 uh, in the bundle? Uh, the other source of criticism about the report Uh, and this is the issues for your legal advisors section. Uh, and Mr. Large tells us that he's seen very little information on the planning consent, um, no information about building regulations, no guarantee documents have been provided, um, but inquiries should be, regarding any available guarantees, should be made by your legal advisor. Uh, the judge's criticism was, well, um, it ought to have been recommended there that there was an architect's certificate. The point I would seek to make is that, um, obviously we don't go behind that, but the point I would seek to make is that it's important to note that this is, as it were, in the category of issues for your legal advisor. And the surveyor is not actually going to get these documents or indeed advise about, in, in the case of an architect's certificate, a precise form of certificate which may be appropriate. Well, that's why you said the solicitors in this case were negligent. Yes, indeed. And that's why the judge, where well, the solicitors weren't at trial, concluded that Effectively, they probably were, but that, that didn't break the chain of causation. Yes, uh, that's right. But th these factual features are important when one thinks about the measure in my submission, because if it had been the duty of the surveyor to obtain the architect's certificate or to advise on its um, precise terms, then that would justify a different measure of loss. That would take one away from condition of the property, what should one pay for it, given its condition and given such contractual protection as may be available, which is what the surveyor is... Well, aren't these in reality submissions to the scope of the duty? Well, I mean, I mean, they're concerned with the measure of loss, but the measure of loss has to reflect what the scope of duty is. Well, we know what the scope of the duty was because that was found by the judge. Yes. <clears throat> Um, l let me move on from the um, report. Um, the other factual matter that I need to pick up is the events on the 17th of November. Um, and just to put that in context, that's about five days before the um, exchange takes place on the 22nd. Uh, and what happens in this case um, is that um, the claimants return to Mr. Large um, to seek some supplementary um, advice from him. Uh, and the, um, uh, if one can look at page 89, uh, we can see the nature of the inquiry. Um, we received some information from the seller that gave slight concern, um, referring to the property information form, the Standard Law Society convincing document. Um, it refers to damp proofing underpinning wood treatment. The seller has said no warranties or guarantees available on these sections, given the corners previously cut, for instance, drainage we would value your opinion on whether this is appropriate. Uh, and that leads um, to um, uh, Mr. Large uh, advising. First of all, he has a conversation with Mr. Hart on the 17th. Uh, we can see evidence of that at page 91, uh, where uh, Mr. Hart um, writes to the um, solicitors, um, spoken to the surveyor, uh, we should have sight of the South Ham's completion certificate, in other words, the building regulation certificate, and the architect's completion certificate. We believe they supervised um, uh, the works. Uh, then um, Mr. Large is shown, as it were, a snapshot of what has um, been obtained. Um, over the same um, day, um, the claimants receive the building regulation completion certificate, and they receive a making good defect certificate. 
Uh, we've got that in the bundle, but it's, as, as you may have seen, it's a, it's a certificate an architect will give to his client when snagging problems have been dealt with. Uh, and the criti critical email for these purposes from Mr. Large is what he says at page 94. Um, and he emphasizes that um, the building control completion certificate is essential and comments on that. Uh, and then he says that the making good defect certificate is not the type of certificate I was expecting, which would be more like the professional consultant certificate provided on the Council of Mortgage Lenders website. Uh, and he gives a link to that. Um, the certificate provided seems to any relate to snagging. Not necessarily essential that a certificate is provided, but with a project of this size stated as having been managed by an architectural firm, it would not be unreasonable to ask for this. And, and we, we say an absolutely critical representation next. If such certificate is not available, there may be little practical recourse if it were found that unseen deficiencies exist. You should seek advice on this from your legal um, advisor. Now, um, we, we, we do say that that's um, highly significant um, because there's um, clear advice that without that certificate, you're going to be unprotected uh, against, or maybe unprotected against any um, unseen or latent defects. Uh, and it goes back to the um, legal advisor. Uh, Mr. Um, Large does some of the solicitor's job, we would suggest, because he produces that certificate or gives a link to it. And we can see the certificate at page 95. It's a standard form certificate. Um, it, um, it was agreed in the underlying litigation by reference to the, the well-known case of Hunt and Optima that if given, that would import a duty of care by the architect who has to exercise care when, fulfilling, when filling out that certificate. But so yeah, that doesn't matter because the judge found that the, <coughs> if it had been asked for, there would have been no such certificate provided. No, indeed. I mean, the only point I make about it is that it's not a, it's not a warranty. And Hunt and Optima decided it wasn't a warranty. No, it's not it a doesn't promise matter. Product. What matters is whether or not it was or would have been on the counterfactual provided. And here it wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have been. So, no. um, and the judge went on to find, as a result, had they been told you're not going to get such a certificate, they wouldn't have bought the property. Yes, indeed. And this um, email of the 17th of November was um, provided gratuitously by, by Mr. Large? Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it because was, he was under no obligation. Um, he was. No, he, he, he was he, doing follow-up work uh, as a matter of goodwill. Absolutely right, and um, you know he, he endeavoured to be helpful. I think yes. on, on any fair view, you can see that from the way that he, he dealt with the, the claimants. Um, uh, I think the claimants rather feared a trial that we would say it's outside the scope of the retainer or something of that sort. We didn't accept that. We, 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 the case was run on the basis that he had a duty to exercise reasonable skill and care when advising as he did on this occasion. But actually his, 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 his strict responsibility ended uh, with the provision of his report. Uh, you could argue that. We, we didn't. didn't. Right. All right. Well, maybe that's uh, an interesting topic which we needn't go into. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a point I rely upon for no. these purposes, or could rely upon. But as it happens, he, he, he tried to be helpful. He did. Uh, and the message got across. I mean, the, the, the judge found, as, you, as, as, as the court knows, that um, the the omission to state that a certificate was essential was causative, because if those words had been used, that would have made all the difference. And, and again, I'm not trying to go away from that. Um, however, the factual position was also that the claimants got the message. They did go to their solicitor. They forwarded this email, so the solicitor knew what Mr. Large was saying, and he knew what form of certificate had been highlighted. Um, and the claimants did not want to exchange unless they had what Mr. Large said they should have. And then there was the, what the judge regarded as negligence by the solicitors, as, as, as has been mentioned already, which led to, led to the transaction going ahead. So would that, that would lead to the suggestion that there would be quite a strong contribution claim. Uh, it could well be. Well, I mean, if, if the liabilities were being considered together, um, you would have doubtless argued that the solicitor's liability was even if you were wrong about the measure of loss and they were both liable for the same overall measure of loss, but in contribution you would have been arguing that the solicitors were liable for the lion's share. Yes, indeed. Just on the basis of the documents you've shown us. Indeed, indeed. I mean, obviously the judge was careful to say he hadn't heard from the solicitors. Um, Can I ask, are, are, are there contribution proceedings? Uh, there is an agreement uh, which allows contribution proceedings to be brought, but that is effectively parked at the moment. Yes, well, I understand the parking, but so that is, that is a... There is potential recourse. Yeah. Um, 
the last factual point. Um, no one ever returned to Mr. Lard after the 17th of November. No one ever came back to him to say, well, um, this is what we have, this is what we don't have, should we go ahead? Um, the is that um, 90, is page 94 where the trail ends for Mr. Large? Indeed. Until some considerable time? Many months, later. I think about six months after the purchase had been completed. Uh, and the, if one's asking in South Australia terms, is Mr. Large a, an advisor taking, guiding the transaction? We say, well, factually that should be a non-starter because he's only seeing bits and pieces of what's going on here. We see, he advises in the way that we've looked at, um, he doesn't know what the end game is. He doesn't we, know what emerges. That may be a submission that isn't open to you once we've looked at the judgment. Well, yes, but well, because because um, I mean that point, the judge. It's not as if the judge isn't keenly aware of Samco and the advisor information transaction no transaction points. I would accept that. I mean, we, our submission is he doesn't find that Mr. Um, Large was an advisor. Well, we'll come to that, I'm sure. I think we will. Yes. Is the distinction That's between important. being an advisor in relation to what you should do to follow up the dam or what you should do to follow up the certificate as opposed to being an advisor in relation to whether one should purchase the property? Uh, it, it, it's is everything. that the distinction it's, it's, it's that everything you may be seek, about well, to seek to draw? Well, it's about, it's, about the per, it's about the decision to enter the transaction. But if you're an advisor, then you are encompassing within your duty uh, everything that's material to that decision. Right. Well, when, when you come to look at the judgment, can, can you identify what it was that the judge did find? Indeed. Um, it, uh, as to advice. Oh, okay. um, well, if one now goes to the... Um, Judgment. And um, I mean, just, just, just sort of um, as a point of departure, obviously the judge has found, as a matter of fact, that the claimants, amongst other things, had had assurances from the architects that the property was in good condition. They would have no problems with it. Um, and he accepted that there was no significant damage um, evident at the time of inspection, and, and many, if not most, defects were not observable. And that's paragraphs 148, 149 and 158 of the judgment. The real issue with the property was the latent problems with damp protection and water ingress. Uh, and we can see that running as a consistent theme throughout um, um, the judgment. Um, at 172 and 174, um, the judge made detailed findings about what was and was not defective. And I don't think um, um, it, it would assist your lordship's relationship for me to go through those in detail, but they're all set out there very carefully by the um, judge. Um, can I pick it up, please, at paragraph 187, page 149 of the bundle? Yeah. Uh, which is. Um, Uh, where one gets into uh, the um, findings of um, breach of duty. 187 to 199 are where the judge deals with what Mr. Large should have done in relation to um, that. Yes, indeed, my lord, and, and other um, defects um, as well. Uh, and one can track that through. And in, in, Summarising, um, at 187, um, he, um, um, the, um, yeah, he deals with some what he calls um, relatively, relatively trivial. trivial. But the it's thrust of this section is about damp. Yes. One, 192, 193, and so on. And, and yes, yes, indeed. And if, if, if one looks at 187, 189, um, and uh, 197, you can see some. Re what, in the judge's words, relatively minor defects. And I won't go through them in detail because they're, they're there to be read. Um, um, but um, uh, in the judge's description, they're relatively minor. Um, but as my lord has said, um, the critical negligence from the judge's point of view um, is um, uh, once uh, we get to one paragraph 193 onwards, 
uh, simply assuming that damp protection was present when it was impossible to say whether it was in fact present uh, and should have given advice uh, to confirm the position uh, by consulting the architects or building control uh, and identifying the potential need to open up if need be. Um, but 206 to 8 uh, should have um, recommended in the report get an architect certificate, get a professional consultant certificate. Well, that, that's the second. 187 to 199 is dealing with damp, and then 200 to 215 is dealing with the certificate. Yes, indeed. And at 215, that ends up with the criticism of the 17th of November email, yeah. um, when it was said that um, it wasn't good enough to recommend it. Um, you had to say that it was um, uh, essential. So there are the two strands in relation to breach, the, the damp and the certificate. Yes, and, and uh, the court will have seen that at paragraph 216 at page 158, the sort of distillation that you get from the judge as to his findings, um, his critical conclusions do not, in fact, concern the relatively minor defects at all. They're obviously, they're not irrelevant. They are relevant. Um, but the thrust of his criticism of the surveyor uh, concerns um, damp proofing, failure to warn about that, uh, and um, the architect certificate. Yeah. He doesn't find it, in fact, um, in my lonely friend's supplemental skeleton, there's a finding that there was a negligence in relation to spotting a lack of fire protection to steel columns. I think on a careful reading of the judgment, the judge doesn't find that. Um, so, um, one made it, this, this, it was actually a rather different case at the end than at the start, because if one looks at the particulars of the claim in this case, there's a long list of defects which is said should have been identified on inspection turned out to be a very different conclusion to the one that one might have um, anticipated. Um, the judge then dealt with, starting at page um, 158, paragraph 219, what would then have happened? And uh, as has been mentioned, he does pick out the counterfactual. Um, and um, um, first of all, at 219 to 20, um, he accepts the submission that um, uh, if there had been further probing about damp, then there would have been no worthwhile assurance coming back from the um, from the architects. There would either have been an obfuscation, um, or they would have to um, uh, uh, concede that there could be a problem. There may be a problem. Uh, and in relation to the, um, I think somewhere, if I recall correctly, the architects had pleaded that they wouldn't have provided. Absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, they wouldn't have done. They had no contractual responsibility to provide one. And they wouldn't have done. And they wouldn't have done. And yeah. in, the, in the factual context, we can well, one can well understand whether that was... Well, a, given the fact that the architects were closely involved in the, calling it neutrally, the patching up work that was done immediately prior to the sale, Yes. Um, one can see that that was a pretty easy assumption to have made, that they would not have supplied. Well, okay. Yeah. So this um, passage leads us to 232, doesn't it? I mean, 232, yes, that, my Lord. That's, 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 the, that's the last element of the, the, yes. the factual position. Um, and the, the, the conclusion, I mean, stated, I think, first at 229, page 163, um, no certificate would have been forthcoming. So my Lord, my lead, one can, on the judge's judgment to that, to, to that point, identify what the position would have been if Mr. Large had complied with his duty. Certain relatively minor defects identified, but critically, um, I'm concerned about damp. I can't see the damp protection. Um, I've got no way of saying whether it's there or not. Um, you should investigate further to see what is present and to make sure it's it's properly installed. And secondly, um, because of that concern and the minor concerns about the condition of the property that had emerged. Um, it's essential you have an architect certificate. If that had been followed through, if one supposes what would then have happened, um, no certificate would have been proffered and um, no worthwhile assurance would have been given about the damp protection. That, that, that is the factual position in our submission, faithful to the judge's findings, when one has then to ask what the measure of loss should be. And what I'm seeking to persuade the court is, that, and I'll go through the authorities in a minute. And what I'm seeing to persuade the court is that if, you're, then the correct question is, well, 
what would have been paid for the property in that context, with that in uh, correct advice from a surveyor, with those further factual discoveries that would have been made. Do, do, uh, do you say that paragraph 232, um, whether, whether or not it's um, correct, and we assume it was correct, is, is not relevant to the assessment of damage? I do say that. So that's, well, I'm, well, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to see where, yes. where as it were, you, you uh, are inserting your jemmy <laughs> into the, um, yes, well, uh, the fabric of the judgment here. Um, is, is, is it at this point? that you say that um, the judge should simply have stopped and said, well, no certificate, hmm? um, risk of damp, hmm? I'll now assess damages um, in some, by some means or other um, by um, comparing um, w w with a house that was well, I'm going to take the house just in that condition. Yes. I'm, I'm not going to go on and ask, would they have bought the property? No, he, at the causation stage, he has to ask what they would have done. Because if they would have, obviously, they would have just bought anyway and, and said, well, we'll take a risk, then they have no claim. So they have to prove as a matter of factual causation, either they would not have purchased. Or they'd have purchased for less. Or they would have purchased for less. If they can't do either of those things, they've got no claim. But that, as it were, that fence has been crossed some that, that fence is crossed here, and we don't quarrel with that paragraph 232 of the judge's judgment. What one then comes on to, and this is where setting the scene for the critical question, is what, are the me what is the measure of loss that should be awarded in those circumstances? Yeah. Uh, and on the conventional basis, as I contend, that would require one, given that this is a transactional loss, that's what the surveyor is concerned with, that would require one to identify what would the market pay for the property in this factual context? Now, the, the claimants wouldn't have bought, so the, the, you know, there's a sort of intuitive feeling that they and many other claimants in their position might well have. Well, that's totally unfair to me because I wouldn't have bought and therefore I would not have embraced downstream risks, but that's always the case in these severe cases. Well, we've been over that. The, no, well, thank you. you. You were answering yes. what, what I put to you. Uh, Perhaps if I go to the law next, and yes, then um, come back to that at the, as it were, the critical. The, uh, um, don't let me stop you going to the law, no. please. Um, but it, you've led us to 232 quite rightly, because it's the next section, 233 to 254, which is where the judge deals with the measure of loss and deals with the submissions that you made about what the right measure of loss was. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, and I'm going to come back to that. Yeah. Um, but can I set the scene for that analysis by looking at the authorities as quickly as I can? Yeah. Um, my Lord, if we could, my, my Lord, that was really, if we could take up the authorities. Um, uh, and start at the first authority, Phillips and Ward. Just tell us before we start, how many of these are you going to take us to? Oaks and Ward? Four, or possibly five. Yeah, that's right. Which are they? Uh, Phillips and Ward, Perry and Phillips, Watson Morrow, uh, Hughes Holland, and Thompson. That's five. Yes, five. I, I do okay. apologize. Five. Thank you. Right, Phillips and Ward. Yes. Phillips and Ward, um, one can really get the point at the, um, the head note um, here. Um, well, a negligent survey, uh, um, purchased for £25,000 when it was worth £21,000. Um, after moving in, the claimants found they had to spend seven um, to remedy the, um, the defects. Uh, the loss was um, awarded at £4,000, the difference between the value as described and as it should have been described. Uh, and that measure was vindicated in the um, Court of Appeal. One can see that at 473. And it's authority for the proposition that you get the diminution, not the cost of repair. Yes, indeed, uh, my lord. Um, 
And, but if one can look at the way it's put by Lord Justice Denning at um, the start of his judgment of 473, um, the way he approaches that halfway through that first paragraph, if Mr. Ward, the surveyor, had carried out his contract, he would have reported the bad state of the timbers. On receiving that report, Mr. Phillips um, would either have refused to have anything to do with the house, in which case he would have suffered no damage, or he would have bought it for a sum which represented its fair value in its bad condition. In which, excuse me, in which case he would pay so much less on that account. In effect, either way, the proper measure of damages is the difference between the value in its assumed good condition and the value in the bad condition, which should have been reported to the client. So, in causation terms, the claimant, the claimant might do one thing or the other. If he doesn't buy, he saves himself the £7,000 cost. But that's not his loss. His loss is always the overpayment. Uh, and a similar analysis, perhaps if I could just ask um, uh, the court to note it, it's perhaps most helpful um, in Lord Justice Morris's um, judgment at 475 at the um, bottom of the page, where he supported the decision of the official referee and went on over the page to um, make the same point about this is the product, as it were, of what would have happened if a competent report had been given. And then last, Lord Justice Romer, uh, towards the bottom of page 477. Uh, and again, the same point. If the plaintiff had received a report which revealed these defects, he would have known he would have to spend 7000 in addition to finding the purchased money for the house. He might have decided he wouldn't buy, in which case he would have kept his money in his pocket and had no house. On this hypothesis, his ignorance of the defects may be said to have worsened his position to the extent of £4,000, for he parted with twenty five and became the possessor of property worth only twenty one. As an alternative to deciding not to buy the house with knowledge of its defects, he might have made up his mind to purchase at the reduced value of 21 and carried out the works which had to be done at the cost of seven. In that event, he would have had to spend 28 instead of the 32 total expenditure which resulted from his buying the property on the faith of the defendant's report. On this hypothesis also, his position was worsened to the extent of £4,000. And Rosemary, we'd, we'd, we'd say, well, that um, is one see two things going on there. One is contrasting the, 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 the value of the property and the condition in, in which it was described and in which it should have been described. That's, as it were, the bracket. Uh, and one sees that that is the loss on the purchase, on the purchase that is sustained. Whether or not the claimant would have bought or negotiated. And my lord's lady, Perry and Sidney Phillips, um, now on to nineteen eighty two, and Lord Denning still um, in the Court of Appeal, Master of the Rolls now, um, is to precisely the same effect. And can I just give the um, references um, at the bottom of page one three o one, over onto one three o two, and in Lord Justice um, Oliver's judgment, um, one three o three at F over the page to 1304A. So the, the sidelined <coughs> passages. Yes, yes, yeah. please. And so the compensatory principle is the foundation for that measure, but it's all focused on the transaction, the purchase, and what's paid for it, and the position you would have been in if you had had a correct report. And Watson Morrow, um, um, the 1987 decision at um, um, tab four in the bundle, uh, one can see reading through that decision that the Court of Appeal obviously was concerned with a fundamental challenge to that approach, and in particular an attempt to uh, 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 persuade um, the judges that the cost of repair measure should be available, at least in some cases, uh, instead, and that was um, uh, rejected. Uh, but in doing so, um, the court um, expressly um, had regard to and upheld the um, validity of the reasoning in those earlier um, cases. Uh, and they cited from um, uh, I I I extensively. Uh, and if I could just pick that up um, at one citation, at 1436, please. Uh, 
Um, the, Lord Justice Ralph Gibson at this point um, is, um, in fact, one needs to turn back to the previous page to see how it develops, but the, um, the fact that it's reasonable for the plaintiff to retain the property and to do the repairs is irrelevant to the determination of the question whether recovery of the cost of repairs is justified. Wait, sorry, where are you reading from? Sorry, this is just from the bottom of 1435 over to 1436. Oh, right, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and that's developed at 1436, just before B. The position is no different from Phillips and Ward. Plaintiff would either have refused to buy or he would have negotiated a reduced price. Recovery of the cost of repairs after having gone into possession, that is to say, in effect, the acquisition of the house at the price paid less the cost of repairs at the later date of doing those repairs, is not a position in which the plaintiff could have been put as a result of the proper performance of the contract. And that, uh, that's not the result that, that, that my client could have put the claimants in um, here. Um, they could not have been put in the position uh, in which they both had the property and had a property in good condition which it would be in once rebuilt. Now, it's true, and my learned friend um, in one of his skeletons makes the point, well, sometimes you see formulations of the measure um, as being the difference between the property in its assumed condition and its actual condition. Um, but, in, but, 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 in, but in my submission, that's just shorthand, because in most cases, the negligence is failure to uncover the actual condition of the property. That doesn't detract from the, 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 the basic point that one is seeking to identify the value loss that's attributable to the misdescription. So, we, 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 we say that the South Australia decision is entirely consistent with that um, line of authority. And if, because it is, um, provides a uh, recent and authoritative um, summary of the principles, can we look at Hughes Holland at tab 14 and not? Um, at South Australia itself. Yeah. And within um, the Hughes Holland decision, if one goes to paragraph 39, at page 63 of the report, um, there's an important summary here, I would respectfully suggest, of the, um, the principles. Um, and um, Lord Sumption draws attention to the descriptive in inadequacy of the difference between advice and information. But then um, at 40, um, we can see what advice is really concerned with. That's where it's left to the advisor to consider what matters should be taken into account in deciding whether to enter into the transaction. His duty is to consider all relevant matters, not any specific factors in the decision. If one of those matters is negligently ignored or misjudged, and this proves to be critical to the decision, the client will in principle be entitled to recover all loss flowing from the transaction which he should have protected his client against. Why isn't that directly in point here, the one matter that is absolutely essential is a practical completion certificate? Well, in my submission, my lady, that is because you have to stand back and see what the role is that the um, professional is undertaking. So if um, Mr. Large had been a Renaissance man, qualified as a solicitor and as a valuer as well, uh, and had been not only reporting on the condition and the need for a um, professional conduct certificate, professional um, um, consultant certificate, but also uh, had been advising about legal matters, and indeed anything else that was material to the claimant's decision to purchase, whatever those considerations might have been, that would constitute Mr. Large as the advisor. He's not quite taking the decision for the client, but it is, it's very close to that, because he is reporting on um, uh, everything, to a duty to consider all relevant matters and not any specific factors in the decision. And of course, to do that, the advisor one would expect would be privy to be, be privy to all relevant information. 
Well, Mr. Large certainly was not. He did not see the convincing file. He did not see whatever certificates were provided. For all he knew, the Larges, the, the Hearts had obtained an architect's certificate before proceeding. He, he, he simply wasn't positioned in a way which enabled him to report as um, a, an advisor. And the, of course, if there is an advisor, then it doesn't matter that you negligently assess risk A, this is the bottom of paragraph 40, but the actual loss is caused by risk B. If direct advice would have stopped the claimants proceeding with the transaction, then the claimants get everything. But of course, the information category, which is um, um, uh, we say this case is, um, is very different. I think it's right to say, isn't it, at no point does the judge say this is an information case. No, he doesn't say that, but he... He, he does, does, however, say it's an advice on a number of occasions this is an advice case. Well, uh, I mean, my, my Lord, I, I, I quite appreciate that it's a question of labels and, and, you know, we have to do our best with what we have. But the words used by the judge, having cited all of these cases, um, well, certainly Samco, Hugh Holland, um, is advice, and he never uses the word information. Well, um, well uh, I mean, it just it makes it rather difficult to say to us, well, this is an information case. Well, my lord, I'll have to take you to the judgment and try and support the submission. But he he, he doesn't say. Well, we've looked the, at the judgment up to the, the third, in, indeed. the end of the third of the key findings, yes. where in the paragraph the word is advice. My Lord, yes. But he then comes on to confront the question of whether um, um, Mr. Large is an advisor in Samco um, or Hughes Holland terms and does not go that far. He doesn't attach that conceptual labour, that categorisation. He doesn't attach that to, to Mr. Lowe. Well, we'll look at the, the judgment, because he's clearly... You might have a bit of difficulty with paragraph 252 with that submission. Well, my lady, that's the key paragraph. I am going to come on to that. Can I, can I return of to Of course, that? sorry. I was, just, I was just picking you up because you said information, and I think it may be going... It may be asking too much of us to say that we should find that this was an information case in the light of the fact that there's no such finding by the judge, and it could be contradictory by various passages. Whether it goes as far, your point really is, well, is the judge going too far? Um, well, um, if, as you if, say, if, by reference yes. to paragraph 40 of Lord Sumption, which you've just shown us, well, uh, uh, to be, to be uh, caught by this, effectively, you've got to have much more information and knowledge than Mr. Large has. Well, yes. I, I, no, that, that submission I follow, yes. I, I was just, I think it might be the slightly wilder shores to get on to the information and advice in, in the circumstances of the judgment and the envelope of the appeal. Yes, Maud. Well, I mean, I was... Speaking I'm, for myself. Y yes, I mean, it's very helpful to know, as it were, yeah. uh, what the perspective is from the bench, but um, the... I, well, I, I will, mind. I will, well, indeed, but it's obviously a point I need to address carefully, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I, will, I will do that. But, but if... In my latest submissions, I am able to persuade you that the judge didn't go so far as to say that Mr. Large was or became an advisor. If I can persuade the court of that, yeah. then um, plainly this passage is highly material uh, because... Um, this, is, this is the main the, the main bit of learning that you you want us to consider, is it? It, it, is, it is, my lord. I mean, I mean, the, um, the, the previous instances are, um, are, are rather more conventional. Well, cases which you, where, where you see how it's been dealt with the, generally, but the analytical material here is the is the heart of your uh, of your case. Well, in, in, I mean, in some areas, the Sam K decision has, has acted as a sort of solvent and has thrown everything up in the air, and has it's had to be reworked and reanalyzed, and sometimes the, the outcome is very different to what it was before the South Australia case. My I submission is that that Lord doesn't apply here. I think it's only Lord Sumption who had the um, courage to. Reanalyze Lord Hoffman. I think, I think, uh, those of us of a lower rank wouldn't have dreamed of so doing. Well, no, I'm not going to be drawn into <laughs> that. Into that. Um, but I mean, if if, if I'm right that um, um, the, ju the judge didn't categorise this as an, as an advice case, it's not an advisor in in, in, in Samco terms, 
Uh, then um, all these points, in particular the, the ones that one sees developed at paragraph 41 apply. Um, in such a case, if we can pick it up halfway through that paragraph, as Lord Hoffman explained in the Nye Credit decision, the defendant's legal responsibility doesn't extend to the decision itself, even if the material which the defendant supplied is known to be critical to the decision to enter the transaction. He's liable only for the financial consequences of its being wrong, and not for the financial consequences of the claimant entering into the transaction, um, so far as these are greater. Well, if the, um, if the negligence had simply consisted of the failure to draw the attention of the purchasers to the damp proofing course, you might have been on stronger ground. The difficulty in this case is the, um, is the certificate point. Um, if it, if it were, you could have easily submitted to the judge, and I, I don't know what he would have done, but I think uh, there would have been a harder, there would have been more of a difficulty. Um, the, the purchasers, if he'd simply stopped short at um, not saying, um, by the way, I didn't look at the damp proofing and there's a latent defect in relation to the damp proofing, because that would be a classic so sur surveyor's negligence case. The I problem guess. here is that you've got what might be termed a hybrid, uh, where you've got a failure to inform in relation to the damp proofing, followed by a failure to advise properly in relation to the certificate? Yes, Melania, we, we, we say that that has to be seen in the context of the surveyor's role. Um, issues for your legal advisor. Uh, it's not, not his job to get the certificate. Um, yeah. It's his job to flag something up for the legal advisor then to address. And what, what the surveyor is concerned with throughout is the condition of the property and the value, the value, the, the price it's reasonable to pay for the property in its having regard to what can be ascertained about it. And, and we say that's a critical part of the context. If it has been his job to get the certificate, then one could see that the, as it were, that could cast a different shadow entirely. That might cast a much longer shadow, which takes one into looking at what the certificate would have been worth at the downstream consequences. It takes you away from the transactional loss and takes you into the events which happen post-purchase. What, what do you mean by the expression transactional loss uh, to be um, Well, uh, what, I mean, what I mean by it, my lord, is that you, you can see in the foundational cases, the surveyor's cases back to the 1950s, that the duty is concerned with the decision to purchase. What is the condition of the property I'm thinking of buying? What is the fair price for it? And that's why when you ask um, um, what would be the position you would have been in if the report had been undertaken properly, you're focusing in those cases on the overpayment loss. You're assessing the loss at that point and saying that's the capital loss that you lost, that, that, that overpayment is the consequence of the, of the failure to advise properly. So is it... Um, Put another way, that it's defining the loss at the time. That's a feature of it, because that is the date of assessment. Whereas, if one had given a warranty, or you know, if one had given a warranty that you won't have any problems with this property, or something of that sort, then the scope of inquiry would extend much further. You would look at what in fact happened when a property is purchased. And if you have latent defects in a case like this, then um, the obligation to compensate will embrace them. So everything that you uncover when you look below the surface, when you live in the property, and defects start to manifest themselves, then becomes part of the, the loss that the surveyor is responsible for, in, in the unlikely event that the surveyor gives a warranty. But the, the whole point of those cases, as, as was said in um, Perry, is that the surveyor doesn't give a warranty. He's just advising, in the context of a transaction, an imminent purchase or an imminent decision about whether or not to purchase and what to pay. And that's why the, that's why the measure is bound up with the, um, with the overpayment loss. The extent to which you pay too much by reference to what you weren't told. is the purchase of the property. Yes, indeed. Yes. My Lord, um, the last point on the authorities um, was that um, what a slightly unusual factual feature of this case is that 
um, which one needs to, to, to build into the picture, is that it's not just a situation of a surveyor negligently identifying things in his report. It's a situation of a surveyor negligently um, failing to recommend or failing to recommend sufficiently emphatically the need for further inquiries and the obtaining of a certificate. Uh, and that, that's whether we come back to that counterfactual that we looked at earlier. What, as the judge found, would have happened if, if, if a correct report had been given? Uh, now, um, but there, um, if I can persuade you it's an information case, there one needs to decide what evidence are you going to take account of when valuing the property in this world in which there had been a competent report given. And the Thompson case, uh, which is the last authority I wanted to take um, um, the court to, at uh, tab 12, is, the, um, is a useful decision here. Um, it, it's a, a well-known case, which the court may know very well, about um, um, a very wealthy claimant purchasing at auction uh, Louis XV vases, as they were, in effect, described. Uh, and she um, both relied upon a catalogue catalog entry to that effect. Uh, she also had the services effectively of advisors that the auctioneers provided as a wealthy and valued client. She had the benefit of, as it were, advice around the edges of the auction process. Uh, she then um, uh, learned, or thought she learned, that the vases were in fact later copies, uh, and she sued for the, um, the loss on the purchase having paid 1.75 million, it was said that they were worth about 25,000 pounds. And the gist of her um, complaint was um, that um, you, um, um, Christie's, should have alerted me both in the catalogue entry and in the advice you gave to me, um, tailored advice by, by the advice you gave to me um, separately, uh, that there were reasons for concern, reasons for doubt about the date of the vases. They might not have been 18th century at all, and about the place of their manufacture. They might not have been um, French. Now, um, the Court of Appeal um, um, found um, that um, uh, th they allowed an appeal against the finding of liability. Uh, but um, the measure of loss and what was material evidentially to the valuation exercise was fully argued. and um, argued um, by Mr. Sumption for the appellants and Lord Gravener for the um, respondents. And if one could pick it up, please, at um, paragraph 99 at page 738. Uh, Mr. Sumption was arguing um, uh, an argument which um, is, is, in effect, what I'm seeking to argue um, today. Um, judge's decision as to the measure of damages was wrong. Sorry, I should have said what the judge had done is made a finding as to what the, the likelihood that the vases were 18th century. He found that there was 70% 70, 70 chance that they were 18th century. And therefore, he had um, assessed the true value on that basis. And in coming to that finding, he'd taken account of um, metallurgical and other scientific evidence which bore upon the correct date of manufacture. And Mr. Sumption's point, um, if breach of duty is established, the measure of damage is the difference between what Miss Thompson paid and the value of the vases in 1994 as they should have been described. The difference between the price paid and the price that would have been paid if the doubts had been known. Yes. Not, uh, the, not the difference between the price paid and the actual value. Indeed. Uh, and um, ev the, the evidential point towards the bottom of that paragraph, anti penultimate sentence, um, 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 the, the judge had taken account of metallurgical evidence which was not relevant either to Christie's duty or to the appropriate measure of damage. And the reason for that was that um, at the time, no one would have had that metallurgical scientific um, evidence. Uh, Lord, Lord Graminer said there's nothing wrong, you can, you, can, you can take account of that. This is just a question of working out what the value of what was purchased, with all the flaws that come to the fore later and um, through later uh, investigation. Uh, and that, for, your, for your lordship's your ladyship's note, that's at 
paragraph 111. But can I take you to um, paragraph 124 onwards on page 744? Judgment of um, Lord Justice May with which um, the other members of the court agreed. Um, it's agreed damages should be assessed at the date of the sale. Um, Ms. Thompson's case is that the measure of damages, as the judge held, the difference between what she paid and their actual value, taking account of what is now known. Christie's case is it's the difference between what she paid and the value if they'd been correctly described or if she'd been properly advised. This would be or would approximate to the price which would have probably been paid at the auction if the catalogue had described the vases as um, probably at the, the um, 15th. Um, that whole following passage is, is of interest for present purposes, but as time is short, can I ask um, the court please to move on to page 746, paragraph 128. Um, Ms. Thompson does not contend that Christie's warranted their information. Lord Gra Gravener does, however, say that they were advisers and not mere providers of information. Insofar as this matters, I don't think Lord Gramley is right here. Christie's duty was to provide advice in the nature of information to enable Ms. Thompson herself to decide whether to bid or not. Numerous elements of that decision which didn't come within the scope of Christie's duty at all. Um, and then at 129, um, don't think that a distinction between an advisor and a provider of advice in the nature of information is critical to determining the proper measure of damage. As I have said, the measure of damage has to relate to the scope of the responsibility assumed and the breach of the resulting duty of care. Uh, Christie's duty didn't extend to carrying out metallurgical analyses, and the measure of damage should not embrace the results of such analyses. The breach of duty which the judge found related only to the provision of the information. Um, I conclude that on the assumptions I'm making, the measure of damage in this case would be the difference between what Ms. Thompson paid for the vases and their value at auction in 1994 if Christie's had described them as probably, probably uh, Louis XV. But this was on the assumption that the liability case was established and that there ought to have been advice given drawing attention to doubts about the date of manufacture uh, and um, place of manufacture. And on that basis, um, uh, that was the um, correct um, measure of loss. Uh, and of interest for present purposes, I'd respectfully suggest, is that 131, um, Lord Justice May then refers to the surveyor's cases, um, Phillips and Ward uh, and um, uh, Perry and Sidney Phillips, uh, and towards the bottom of that paragraph, um, there's a sentence, it is, I think, implicit in each of these cases that the surveyor would not be liable for and the measure of damage would not embrace a concealed defect which the surveyor did not spot but without negligence. It would be supposed that the defect would remain concealed and that the national sale price which would establish this part of the damages calculation would not take it into account. The surveyor doesn't warrant the value of the property um, surveyed. So the key part of the sentence you referred to is the but without negligence. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And, and so um, I, I accept that those things which ought to have been identified, and it may not just, in, in most cases, it will be defects, but in this case, one also has um, the concerns about the property and the fact that there ought to be an architect certificate, and there wasn't, which ought to have been given further emphasis. Those play into the, that, that all plays into the valuation exercise. What doesn't play into the valuation exercise in, in, in our submission uh, is the um, factual information which was would never have been ascertained uh, at, at the time, just like the scientific evidence in the Thompson case. So can I now go back to the judgment? So back to the core um, bundle um, and picking it up at page 164. And um, the court will have seen that the judge um, poses a highly pertinent question, and um, uh, it's agreed it should be a diminution in value measure. The only question is precisely how that should be formulated. Um, refers to the submissions. Um, quotes my submissions at paragraph 238 on page 165. Can I just draw the court's attention to precisely what was said 
um, on behalf of Mr. Large. Um, and what I was addressing in this part of my skeleton argument uh, was the me different measures of loss which featured in the claimant's pleadings. If you look at those pleadings, we can, perhaps if we could just look at them very quickly. If we could look at page 219, which is the amended particulars of claim at trial. What the claimants have done is offer a number of different variations on a theme in terms of the measure of loss. Um, the first measure, 28A, the difference in value between the property with the defects as reported to them in the report and the defects which should have been reported. Now, that, that is precisely or very close to what I'm saying the measure should have been. In other words, um, what is the value of this property taking account of what should have been reported? I say not just defects, but also the other concerns that the judge eventually identified. Um, over the page at um, page 221 of the bundle, um, I think we can forget about B, because that wasn't relevant on the judge's findings. That only concerned the position if there was a building survey. And then it was said, as a result of the last allegation of negligence, the difference in value between the property with the defects as reported in the report and the value with all defects which in fact existed. And what that related to was an allegation that the surveyor should have said, well, um, there may be further defects. And it was being said, well, that carried with it, therefore, a much more expansive measure of loss to embrace all the defects of the property. And then finally, a, a last variation, um, because there was a failure of advice about an architect's certificate, the value of the claim claims would have had against the architect. Now, my, my lady, that was the context from, from, from my um, written submissions, quoted at 165. And dealing with the 28C variation, that is, the difference in value between the property with defects as reported and its value with all defects, I said that was wrong in principle, looking, looking in paragraph 97 of my submission. Um, claims are entitled to damages for the difference between what they paid for the property in its assumed condition and its value of the competent report had been given. If the first defendant should have reported as suggested, one has to ask what the value of property would have then have been in the light of that information, the, the effect that there could be unknown defects, not what its value would have been if all latent defects had somehow been made known, as they subsequently were. Now, um, the, the judge um, um, carefully cited from the um, South Australia and Hughes Holland um, authorities. Um, but can I pick his judgment up again at um, 200, paragraph 246, page 171? Uh, because the judge said, in the present case, the argument put forward on behalf of Mr. Large, I should assess damages by identifying any defects in the property which a competent surveyor should have noted and reported upon and assess the extent to which any such defects would have reduced the value of the property below the sum advised of 1.2 million. Well, well, that wasn't quite what I was saying. Um, um, I, I was, in fact, asking, uh, you know, presenting the hypothesis, the, the, the scenario, well, what would the value have been if the, there had been a correct report? And of course, when one, one formulates these submissions, one doesn't know which way the judge is going to go in his findings. So it's a little difficult to anticipate everything that might emerge in the judgment. But in fact, my submission about the measure of loss was rather different to how it is summarized by the judge there. And so when the judge says that that would produce a gross injustice, uh, we agree with that. It, it would produce a gross injustice if that's what we were contending for, but it isn't. Uh, he then goes on to well, refer what, what, to the... What's the practical difference, though? I mean, you were saying that it should be the assessed at the time of the purchase, the difference between the condition as reported uh, and uh, the condition as it should have been reported. Yes. Um, but from... Uh, um, so that might be a slightly inaccurate precy, but the guts of it remain the same, surely. Well, well, no one would be Smith, because you... You know, you need, you then How much did you say? What, what was the figure that arose out of your formulation? Uh, that wasn't dealt with in the evidence. 
and the, and the reason for that was because um, it was impossible to predict what the um, the findings that the judge actually made. I don't quite follow that. This was a trial of liability and quantum. It yes, indeed. Split off. Yes. So, so um, your 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 way of putting it, um, um, uh, let, the, the, as I've just done, um, um, would have either produced no discern well, hadn't produced any discernible figure. No specific figure had been identified for that hypothesis. And the, the, the trial was predominantly fought, again, if one looks at the pleadings, it was fought on the basis that all the defects could have been identified. Yes, no, I understand that. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a perfect forensic exercise, I accept. No. Um, but the, I mean, the, the judge could um, have, um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, with the benefit of hindsight, it would be nice to know what the liability findings were before. Well, I understand that, but but um, you know the judge was um, in the position of having to deal with all of the issues, um, and um, um, whether two four six uh, misstates what you say, um, what, what sorry what you said, um, the the essential point remains the same though, doesn't it? Because the difference on your way of doing it would also have meant. Um, that the judge would have said what he said at 247. Well, it, it, on his it, on his earlier findings, they would have they, they they purchased because of on the judge's findings the failures on the part of um, Mr. Large uh, and the assessment of on on the, the difference between. Um, as reported and as it should have been reported, if you just look at that, um, the, the difference is likely to be minimal. Well, not necessarily. Well, on, but on the basis of the other findings. Well, I mean, one needs to build in the, the factual position as it would have developed, the counterfactual that the judge traced. Uh, one, one is supposing that a valuer is going to value the scenario the judge arrived at. In other words, that uh, there are these... Um, relatively minor defects, um, which you know could, could have been priced in fifty thousand pounds or whatever that might be. When I say relatively minor, bearing in mind I don't wish to diminish them, but just in the scheme scheme of the case as a whole. Um, then you have your supposing you've got a surveyor who is drawing attention to the um, fact that the damp um, is not um, is not clear. The damp protection is present. There is a big question mark there, particularly when you don't get any worthwhile assurances about that from the architect or anywhere else. And then you get um, the surveyor saying you've got to have a, uh, it's essential you have a. All right, anyway, you, you, you don't quibble with 247. Um, I don't quibble with 247 is 246 is right, but I do, I do submit that it's not a gross injustice if the measure that we contend for is adopted. Well, I'm I, still struggling to work out where that gets us, um, even in a ballpark financially. Are you saying that the correct measure is the difference between what they paid for the property, 1.2 million, uh, and what they would have paid for the property if it had got, uh, if it, if it was known that it had inadequate damp proofing? I don't think you are. No, we're not saying that. No, I didn't think you were. No. Because that that might actually produce something substantial. Um, but you're not even saying that. No. In which case, I think my lord is right. Well. I mean, in fact, in my first skeleton, at the end of my first skeleton, I did put some forward some alternative measures. And as a fallback position, if, if one wanted to look for something which was, um, if you don't accept my primary submission, if you wanted to look for something nevertheless which was closer um, to what the surveyor got wrong, given that the whole problem that the surveyor should have been concerned about was damp, then the, the measure that your leadership has just articulated is an alternative. But that's not my primary submission. The primary submission is that just as in the foundational surveyor's cases, you have to work out what the, what the surveyor should have reported and what would then have been known, and in this case, taking account of the further inquiries and the unsatisfactory outcome of those further inquiries. I mean, just, just to follow through the how does that How does that impact on the value of, 
I get the under I understand what you mean by transactional value. The difference between what they what 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 it's worth and what they've paid for it. But how do you measure what it's worth on that scenario? How do you begin to measure what it's worth on that scenario? Well, that that that, that my lady, of course, is something that one would need expert evidence to to address. But there wasn't any, and this was liability in quantum. Um, the judge could have done his best. The judge could have directed further evidence from the experts to address the scenario that he was reaching towards. I mean, in the Thompson case, um, we, we saw there in the Court of Appeal that if the Court of Appeal, having stated what they said the measure should have been, if liability was established, they then said, oh, well, there would have to be a, a, a reassessment. It was easy for them to do that because they were finding there was no liability. Right. This is a judge with, you know, um, what had obviously been a difficult case with a difficult background, um, with, um, you know, question marks as to whether people could really afford this sort of litigation. Um, um, this was, it had come all the way to trial with one remaining defendant. The judge doing his best in accordance with the overriding objective has to try and arrive at a solution. My, my lord, I accept that, but that solution has to be in accordance with principle. Well, I, that I follow, but, and but that, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the position we're in. Uh, and um, if you're right, it would require assessment of the, the uh, evaluation of further investigations and their absence, mm. which is potentially impossible to value. And so the judge doing his best, I quite agree, in accordance with principle, may have to be slightly more broad brush. Well, it may be, my lord, and, I, and I'm not suggesting that it would have been impossible for the judge, with the evidence in front of him, to have come out at a, a figure. Um, he had figures for costs of repairs, and in fact, in the, in, in the supplementary bundle, you'll have seen a, a, a Scott schedule with some pricing on it, etc. Uh, and um, he would have been involved effectively in ascertaining what the risk premium was that any purchaser would have wanted to buy this property. In other words, to what extent would you pay less because of the uncertainties and the real doubts about the architect certificate and about the um, the state of the damp proofing and water ingress protection. Um, the, the judge could have could have found his way to a conclusion on that, and if necessary, he could have said, "I want to hear from the valuers a little further." On. Could have said, "Well, any sensible home buyer um, would assume the worst, and that there was no damp proofing, and therefore um, pay the difference between a house without damp, damp proofing and a house with." Well, I mean, I, I, I can't rule out that possibility, no. my lady, but that, that, that would have been for the judicial assessment. And, you know, again, this at the point of the transaction, which is where the loss is measured, um, these are known unknowns. And as it turns out, as ill luck would have it, it was about as bad as it could ever be on the spectrum of possibilities. Mm. It could have turned out that, in fact, the damp proofing was fine. But. That doesn't affect the point of principle. The point of principle is that you assess the loss by reference to what the valuation figure would have been with all that information which ought to have been in play at the point of purchase. And and what, what, what figure was being um, presented to the judge, if any? Well, well, one needs to remember that it was... The, the, I appreciate the, there was a kaleidoscope of possibilities. There was a kaleidoscope but, of possibilities. But, but, but uh, uh, in, in the end, we, we do live in... In a real world where a we, we are entitled to ask well what was the judge to do um, and um, and b what are you suggesting that we should do yes uh, well pleaded, pleaded case was eight hundred and ninety nine thousand wasn't it indeed so it was the that was on the basis that every single alleged defect existed and many of them the judge found didn't exist but on the basis that every alleged defect existed it would be necessary to um, knock down this property and rebuild it. Uh, where the judge ended up, he didn't accept that every defect existed, and you can see various things he rejected. But he took the view that once you, once the repair costs would exceed a threshold, I think it was two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, no, I was, more, you I was more thinking about what your case was to uh, to, uh, to, to, to the judge. In others, what you were saying, you should award this on this basis, um, and and also further to that, 
And what are you going to ask us to do if the appeal was to succeed and to send it back for an assessment? Well, I, I mean, we were addressing the case that the property was defective throughout and that the surveyor should have seen that. That was the, that was the case that was brought against it. Right. Uh, and um, we, so our evaluation evidence addressed that premise. Uh, and it was the, the gist of that evidence was this property is such a trophy property in such a position that, in fact, a buyer would pay um, something much closer to the payment price for it and incur the cost as a second home of, 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 of rebuilding it. Um, so that, 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 that and no loss. No, 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 certainly a loss, but on the, on the basis that it was defective throughout, I don't have the precise figure, I'll find it over the lunchtime adjournment, um, something like £200,000 is my recollection. Yeah. I think the judge may mention it somewhere. And the judge <laughs> instead calculated the right. diminution at 800 and then made a knockoff of 50 um, to reflect various matters. You would get a better property, as it were. Yeah, than you, you'd have a better property, property than you would have bought. Then, then sorry, than you bought. Yeah. So the one point two plays. Um, um, uh, so that is brought into the mix. But he ended up by a route which was not the route the claimants were asking him to take. In other words, he rejected the yeah. allegations that most of the defects could have been ascertained. He then, as you know, made those critical findings of negligence, and then said, "Well, the measure of this is why the measure of loss was so critical for the quantum outcome." The measure of loss embraced everything. I may have missed it, but what are you asking us to do? Uh, my Lord, um, you, the, the court would have to direct a reassessment. There is no alternative. Thank you. Um, can I just complete the... I think I've got ten minutes yeah, left. Yeah, we, in, we interrupted you. You were on 247. Yes, my Lord. Sorry. Um, <coughs> and um, the... Um, I'm going to have to be selective in what I deal with. Um, the he, 249, he emphasised that the purpose of a certificate, an architect's certificate, was to obtain some form of protection against the presence of defects a competent surveyor could not identify in a newly rebuilt house. And, and again, we, we obviously accept that, but we say, well, you know, that's something which would have fed into evaluation assessment. In other words, how much would you pay for a property where it should have a, it's essential you have an architect's certificate, but you don't. He said that the approach of, um, we were advocating a trial of two, paragraph 250, transferred all the risk of unidentifiable, unidentifiable defects entirely onto the um, hearts. Um, it, well, you must mention that's not quite right because the um, one, one, one is positing what the value would have been if known unknowns had come into the foreground and one had known that it was essential to have, to have a architect certificate to protect you against latent defects instead of just recommended. And it was known that in this exposed site, um, you couldn't give any assurance about damp proofing uh, and um, that um, you hadn't had any worthwhile um, reassurance about that from inquiries that you had made. So, so you should be responsible for the um, loss occasioned by the absence of the certificate, not by the presence of the defect. The, 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 the loss we should be responsible for is the overpayment, which reflects the fact that the purchasers were ignorant of all these matters of concern. Well, I think I was trying to encapsulate <laughs> what, it, what, what it was that I understand you well, to, to, to be saying. Well, well, we should say that if there's a defect that was unidentifiable, that's not Mr. Large's responsibility. Absolutely right. And that's what the judge is saying at 250 would then transfer um, the unjust to the heart. Uh, he does say that, but. But, but where, the measure, where some of the risk comes back onto Mr. Large's shoulders is that when the valuation exercise is undertaken, what the valuer is doing on, on, under the measure of loss that I'm advocating uh, is working out how much less would have been paid for the property in circumstances where there would have been some very large question marks about the prudence of the purchase. So it would be probable Louis XV. Yeah. You know, you of course, have a value, and um, um, you, you know, a, 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 a value will price that. These extra protections you might get going into a transaction um, will um, typically do have an impact upon what you're prepared to pay for it. The more you're paying, the more risks you're taking. If you're buying at an auction or whatever, the less you're likely to pay. 
So these things do feed into the valuation question. And that the value, what the valuation does is, as it were, at the point of assessment, it is a way of measuring risks. So it's what you would pay for a house <coughs> facing on a cliff, facing the elements, where you don't know whether it's got any proper damp proofing and you haven't got a certificate that says that it does. In, in, and indeed further than that, you don't have an architect's certificate um, to protect you against um, whatever the architect's certificate would in the fullness of time have protected you against. Right. You don't so have that right none of, none, of, none of the comfort that you would expect to have is available. Yes. Uh, and even though you wouldn't have bought it at all in those circumstances, it's, it's the difference of what you would have got with all of those matters versus what you've actually paid. I know, yes. And, and again, one, one can see that... That's the identified in writing. I made a note of it, but in your either of your skeleton arguments, that measure of loss... Because I'm, I'm slightly troubled that you're <coughs> saying that the judge now twice has not accurately summarised what your submissions were. Um, and so, um, can I see the measure of loss in a sentence or a paragraph? Yes. Um, in your skeleton? Your... Yes, in the supplementary bundle. No, no, no. If you're asking us now, the measure of loss is X. Yes. Is that that's presumably in your skeleton arguments? Uh, uh, you're talking about in the underlying trial model. Well, now huh. it's the same point. You're maintaining. You say the same measure of loss. You're, you're un unusually you're taking points about the judge's summary of your submissions yes. as to what the measure of loss was. Yes, indeed. which is unusual and surprising and may create a difficulty. So I'm trying to short circuit that by looking at what you say the measure of loss is by reference to your skeleton argument for us. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, um, the, I think the supplemental skeleton is probably the best place to... Well, I don't mind. Just which, which paragraphs, just so I can, for my note, make a note that that's what you... That, that's your case now as to the measure of loss, given the findings by the judge. Yes, sorry, I didn't have I didn't have that reference to hand. <coughs> but well, perhaps one could pick it up at page twelve of my supplemental skeleton. Page twelve. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the point is repeated here, here in more than one place, but um, at paragraph 26, having referred to the Thompson case, um, I submitted the judge should have taken the same approach, um, having regard only to what would have been apparent had Mr. Large advised as he should have done, rather than including in the measure of loss all the defects which subsequently came to light. Well, that's rather different to what you accepted from a lady just a moment ago. Um, what you'd have paid for a house facing the sea with no damp proof and no certificate. Well, no, with no knowledge about the state of the damp proof and no certificate, which yeah. is, it's the risk, it's the measure yes, it's of the, risk. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the risk, but they, I'm sorry, I wasn't intending, does it, were to contradict myself, and I do apologise if it came across. No, 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 yeah. it's just, it's just um, trying to pin down I understand what, what you say. Yes. What, what, the key, I, I'll it's speak it's for 20, myself, it's I don't... paragraph 27, isn't it, of yeah, your well, skeleton? My lady, yes. And I, I, I would try and anchor it in, it is paragraph 27, yes. Any prudent purchaser would have been concerned by the picture and that the market would have paid commensurately less. That's the closest <coughs> that I can get to a, to any sort of approach. Um, but as I understand it, commensurately less, taking into account the risks, the picture, and the absence of the architect's certificate. Uh, my lady, that's um, precisely so. Yes. Yeah. Um, we, 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 we're not seeking to rule those out of account for the valuation exercise. And that is because um, the, the surveyors' cases have um, focus upon what the value would have been if there had been a correct description. And I, I accept that that has to extend into what further inquiries um, would have um, uncovered on the facts in this case. And the judge helpfully made appropriate findings of fact to, to guide that process. You say that submission at 27 is the same as the one that was quoted um, by the judge from your submissions at trial. 
Well, in effect, yes, although we, I didn't know at, at trial that the judge was going to make the particular... No, no, I'm just saying that uh, you're, 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 you can knit that in with the judge's, the judge's quotation from your submission, although you cavil slightly at the way that he, he, he then summarised yes, it. Yes, indeed, my lord, because it, the, the focus was upon what what should have been reported, and that, that is the scenario, as it were, which guides the valuation process. Because that would have been what the market would have paid if the surveyor's information had fed into the purchase question. Because everything else is hindsight. Everything else is hindsight. And you're not giving a warranty. We're not giving a warranty. We're not assuming the risk of things coming to light later, which were not ascertainable. Um, with with that, um, my lord's lady, can, can we then look um, to um, paragraph 250 to 252 at page 172 of the core bundle? Um, the, the, the judge said that the approach that he um, characterised um, uh, uh, me as having advocated um, transferred all risk of unidentifiable, de unidentifiable defects to the hearts. Um, and, and I would respectfully suggest that, that that's not quite right. Some risk certainly would remain with them, but that's because we didn't give a warranty. Any purchaser who doesn't have a warranty is going to take the risk when they buy a property uh, that defects will emerge which their professional advisors, their surveyor in particular, could not have identified. That's, that's unfortunately just a fact of life, as it were, in the, in, in the way the property market works. But the word transfer is, you say, inapt because um, they were their risks. They were their risks. Unless they were their unless risks. they had contracted them out to somebody else. Yes. What, what they, the, 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 the portion of risk, as it were, that we negligently failed to protect them from is that overpayment that they made, which um, would not have been made if we're given a correct description. The risk of the known unknowns. Yeah, precisely. It's that information which would have fed into the market's valuation of this property as a proposition, which we should pay for. So they would have always taken the risk of some latent defects. But insofar <coughs> as there was negligence in relation to the damp, that's a known unknown, that there's not enough information to be able to assess what the risk is. And therefore, you say, um, an expert would be able to say, well, if the hearts had been equipped with all that information, um, the property with that, the, the value, that would impact on the amount that any purchaser would be willing to pay for this property if they were going to buy it at all. So it might have halved it in value, it might have been um, a quarter of the value, but it would have been possible to assess that. Yes. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, it, you know, it is co common currency in, in my submission that professionals in various fields uh, will not be able to say sometimes. Um, and a, a lawyer may not be able to say whether a point will win at court. It may be a moot point. Um, a, a, a surveyor may say, well, um, I just don't know what's going on in that part of the property. Uh, it may be very conserving, because it may be a fundamental part of the construction, which is, as it were, highlighted as being of doubtful, um, uh, doubtful construction. But but that, that doesn't bring in its train um, a measure which requires you to pay for all the losses when it turns out that there are um, losses. But what is the question that would be sent back for assessment? I mean, clearly we have the fact that the hearts themselves wouldn't have bought the property um, in, with all the risks, without any comfort, as my, my lady put it. Um, so you're, you're, you're asking an assessment in relation to a purchaser, this a, a notional purchaser, who would be willing to buy this particular property and take the gamble. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and my lord, one can effect stop um, at the um, paragraph to 232 of the judgment on page 163, where the judge has teased out the findings of breach of duty. Sorry, uh, page which? This is page 163, my lord. Um, in the procedure. One six three. The, the judge in the preceding section has, has both made clear findings of breach of duty, and he's teased out the immediate causative consequences of the failings of the surveyor. And one has a clear factual picture 
of what would have emerged if correct advice had been given. Yes. But that doesn't help you with the valuation, because you say you ignore that for the purposes of the valuation. Uh, the, for the purposes of the valuation, the fact they wouldn't have bought the property at all is neither here nor there. That, that, that's, that's correct, Marie. Right. I didn't, I, so I think we're going to the wrong part of the judgment <clears throat> with respect. Well, we, I, I, I'm sorry. I, that particular paragraph is, is not material to the exercise, I accept. Mm. Um, I mean, but, the, the short point, Mr. Wilman, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong about this, but the short point is that, that where we get to is that in the careful analysis uh, 233 to 254, under the heading, who is to bear the risk of identifying defects, your case in a nutshell now at any rate is the, the answer to that is not black and white. It's not either me, my client, or the hearts. The answer, given the judge's other findings, is that it is a, a diminution in value to reflect the risk of, as my lady put it, the known unknowns, but the, the, to reflect the fact that, that um, nobody knows anything about the damp proof coursing because that should have been advised by Mr. Large, and the fact that there was no... Um, um, no knowledge of, and therefore no comfort from, a professional consultant certificate. Yes. I mean, I put that inelegantly, trying to shorten no, it. No, it's fair. But that, that's really, I think, <coughs> where we get to. Yeah. Um, and that point, possibly unlike other parts of the bill, that, that point is within the four corners of the judgment, because that, that, that is effectively saying that on this point, part of the, the judgment, the judge approached it as a binary question, and possibly it's not. Well, yeah, I get that. Uh, and, 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 and again, we say that that's, um, that's rooted in principle when you look back at the surveyors' cases, because it takes you to the, the delicacy and the, the, the nuance, as it were, that's necessary when you formulate the valuation question mm. yeah. at the point of purchase, which is when the damage is assessed. And I think, well, well, I, can then, I can then come to 252. Yeah. Um, where the judge said that the analysis in Hughes-Holland, um, the advice information dichotomy, must be considered with particular care. Here, what was needed by the hearts was clear and unequivocal advice that there were risks which simply could not be assessed and against which the hearts needed protection if they wished to proceed. Whilst this is not going so far as to say that Mr. Large had a duty to protect his client against the full range of risks associated with the purchase, and that's a, a, a quotation obviously from the authority, what they needed was advice which was so fundamental to whether the transaction should go ahead that Mr. Large should be held to bear the consequences of such advice not having been given. Now, well, as maybe in my respectful solution, uh, the, 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 the judge is clearly saying that Mr. Large didn't have a duty to protect his client against the full range of risks associated with the purchase. So he is accepting that Mr. Large is not an advisor. Wow. And see, this is again where it's not binary. Again, yeah. is it? That's the problem. That that the judge, you're quite right. The judge is not saying that he's an advisor for all purposes, like in some of the cases. But he he said whilst so on the one hand, on the other, he's saying what they needed was advice, not information. I may say what they needed was advice, which was so fundamental to whether the transaction that should go ahead, that Mr. Large should bear the consequences of that advice having not been given. I think I'll, it's difficult to say he's not, therefore, an advisor. The point may be whether he's not, in quotes, an advisor, as per all of the authorities. Yes. But uh, speaking for myself, I, I am unattracted to that as being um, uh, something to be used to unpick the judge's judgment. He was alive to the very point that you're making to us, and this was his answer to it. Yeah, well, my lord, we say it's a bad answer, I'm afraid. I mean, you know, for what, for what it's worth, that, that is the submission. The answer is at 254, isn't it? I mean, th 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 this is the paragraph that, 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 that your guns are pointed yes. at. Well, well, my lord, yes. Because it, you, you say the measure of damage is to be assessed, um, not the difference um, between um, the, re the defects as reported, um, and the value of the defects which in fact existed, but the value had a correct report been made. 
competent report being made and, uh, and then of bringing course. into the picture the further discoveries that then would have been made. That is, that is that you're it's not going to get It's almost a hybrid case in a funny sort of way because um, your classic Samco cases where somebody is taking on an advisory um, capacity which involves an oversight or an assumption for the for the whole transaction which would include uh, if there's a loss it would include any latent defects because you're taking on a responsibility for the whole transaction and then on the other uh, the other end of the divide you've got pure information now here you've got a mix of the two in a funny sort of way you've got uh, an advisory role but it's a limited advisory role um, and the question is does one approach it in a binary way which the judge appears to have done or is it more subtle which is what you say it should have been right, yes. uh, well, we do respectfully submit that the judge went wrong at paragraph 252 and if one looks back at Hughes Holland and the way that um, Lord Sumption dealt with the convincing cases there um, there's a line of convincing authority which is dealt with in that judgment for instance if a solicitor doesn't report to a lender matters indicative of dishonesty by the borrower client. The lender's reaction might well be, well, I wouldn't want to touch that lending transaction with a barge pole. But that doesn't turn the solicitor into an advisor, in inverted commas. It, the, the, the information no, no, it's a clear that, information case. It's clearly an information case, and the, the, the information may be fundamental. I mean, it always is critical to whether you go ahead or not, because if it wouldn't have made any difference in causation terms, then you don't have a claim to begin with. But that, that's, that's something different from saying that um, you became an advisor in South Australia terms, which means that you're responsible for all the downstream losses. Well, I think you have to say that um, an advisor in South Australia terms involves giving advice, which is in relation to the transaction as a whole and not a fundamental facet of it. Um, what the judge is saying is that if the advice is, goes to a fundamental facet of the transaction, then you are to be treated as an advisor in some good terms. Well, my lady, that, that in our respectful submission, is wrong. And the, the, the hughes Holland case makes that clear. Because um, Lord Sumption expressly disagreed with the line of convincing cases and the reasoning of... Um, Lord, Lord Sumption and the line of convincing cases have got nothing to do with this point, with respect. Um, the line of convincing cases are all about information. There's nothing in Hughes Holland that deals with the specific, as I understand it, and you'll correct me obviously if I'm wrong, there's nothing in Hughes Holland that deals with the position of somebody who is advising, but not in relation to the transaction as a whole, but in relation to a very fundamental part of it. Um, well, my lady, I, I can only, um, I, I hope it might be of assistance. Can I, and I just, just take you back to the authorities, I am, I am coming to a close, I'm conscious I've had my time. Um, in the Hughes-Holland case at tab 14 in the authorities bundle, um, at um, page 626 of that report, um, the Lord, Lord Sumption for the, the court dealt with this line of convincing authority uh, in which as your ladyship said you have solicitors acting providing information yeah. in South Australia terms uh, and those cases it included cases one of them was known as Steggles Palmer we can see it 627 Bristol and West Bring Society in Steggles Palmer um, where the information that was negligently unreported indicated dishonesty on the part of the borrower yeah. and the cases had sometimes in a case like that would allow the claimant to recover all their losses. In other cases it would be limited in South Australia terms to the difference in value of the security. And um, Lord Sumption disagreed with those different outcomes. And if one can pick up his reasoning at paragraph 50, um, he, 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 he doubted whether these were rational distinctions. In all three cases the solicitors were on the face of it supplying specific information in accordance with the lender's standard reporting instructions. The lender would, in due course, take it into account in deciding whether, it, whether and if so, how much to lend, along with other important information for which the solicitors had no responsibility, such as the valuation of the property, the amount of the loan, and the borrower's capacity to service it. The solicitors hadn't assumed responsibility for identifying all matters relevant to the lender's decision, or for advising them whether to proceed. That was a matter for the lender, and would depend not just on the whole of the material before it, but on internal guidance and lending policies. 
Um, these, um, this was an information category. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, if we could leap forward to fifth, paragraph 51 at just below C. Mr. Justice Chadwick, who had been in that, those cases, Ch Chadwick J's approach was to make the measure of damages depend not on the scope of the duty, but on the gravity of the particular breach, and on, on his assessment of the objective quality of the reasons why the lender would have responded by refusing to proceed. In effect, he reverted in Stegall's Palmer to the distinction between no transaction and successful transaction cases rejected in Samco. Uh, and again, a Court of Appeal decision, Portman Billing Society at paragraph 52, similar reasoning criticised at G in, in this report. Um, this involves the same error as affected Chadwick J's analysis, namely that the mere fact that the breach of duty caused the lender to proceed when he would otherwise have withdrawn was enough to make the solicitors legally responsible for the lender's decision and all its financial consequences. All no transaction cases have this characteristic. Whether or not the fact withheld or misrepresented goes to the viability of the transaction or the honesty of the counterparty. So this is all assuming that it's an information. Well, oh, yes, but and the... My lady was putting to you that this might be regarded as a hybrid case. I mean, yes. I assume that you made the submissions about this being an information case to the judge. Yes, indeed. Um, and, and, you know, we have to note that there's no reference to any such finding by the judge. Uh, as, I, as I pointed out earlier, it's, it's simply not a, a word he uses. It's not a category that he identifies. No, um, my lord, and one, one's back to the vexed question of how one analyses paragraph 252. Well, it's limited advice. That's how one analyses it. Whether, whether he's right or whether he's wrong, that's what he's done. He said he's not an overall advisor uh, of the type that Samco recognised as being responsible for everything. Um, he's a limited advisor, but it's an advisory role rather than an information role. And the losses that flow are so fundamental that I'm going to make him responsible for everything. Now, he may be right, he may be wrong about that, but that's how he's analysed it. Well, my lady, we say, we, we, we respect we say that's wrong. Uh, not, not your ladyship's comment, but the, the, the judge's analysis. Well, you, 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 agree, you agree that that is the analysis? Well, I, I'm not sure it is, because I'm not sure that he does go so far as to say that he's an advisor. What they in, in needed South was Australia advice, time. which was so fundamental. What is wrong with the word advice? How can you read advice as meaning information? Well, <laughs> you know, advice in Samco terms and advice in the general currency of that word. You know, one needs to be very careful to distinguish the two. Um, to, if one's We're not to going to be helping the development of the law, though, are we, by, by trying to focus on such nice distinctions? <laughs> Well, 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 save in this respect, my lord, and that is that, you know, we know from the Hughes Holland case and indeed from South Australia what an advisor is. An advisor is guiding the whole transaction. Mm. So if now, <laughs> in this case, one is going to, I mean, the judge may not quite have teased it out, but if one is now going to say that that can be regarded as, or if the court prefers interpreted as, um, acting as an advisor in South Australia terms, that, that, is a, that, that is a new beast previously unknown to the law in my sense. Because the, whereas at the time of Hughes Holland, um, somebody who provided information which may have been critical, which may have been fundamental, um, but is still only providing information, here one is treating a surveyor, um, only one advisor amongst um, the, 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 the suite who are advising the claimants, um, so far as the architect's certificate is concerned, he's not actually responsible for getting it. He's just saying this is something, or should say this is something it's essential to have. You're treating him as guiding the whole transaction. Well, you, I understand that submission. You've made that. So, my lord, we, we, we submit that if, contrary to our submission, um, the judge did um, characterise or categorise the defendant as an advisor in South Australia terms, if he did that, then that cannot be right. Uh, but I would respectfully suggest that he, did, he didn't quite go that far. My lord, um, I've had longer than my allotted share. Um, but that oh, really is it, isn't it? Uh, my lord, the, 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 those are these looking at your the shape that you gave us, what the measure should be you were going to finish with, and I think my lord and my lady have, and I have asked you questions yes. on that fairly comprehensively. My lord, can I just say this, and then I will be quiet, and that is that the, um, the and I'm sure the court is aware of this, but the, the, the consequences for surveyors of um, uh, an analysis of the kind that the judge arrived at are potentially quite significant, because Whenever you have a case in future uh, where the negligence may be um, um, 
I can't say whether this is all right, but there's a defect that I have seen, and I'm concerned about this. There could be other things lurking here. Or wherever you have a case that um, the negligence is, you ought to have had a particular certificate or a, a warranty from the vendors or contractual protection of this sort or the other, anything which might have assisted a purchaser in relation to a purchase transaction. That is potentially going to bring in its train uh, a measure of loss which is very different to the established um, surveyor's measure. Uh, one isn't going to be looking at the transactional loss, as I've called it, the overpayment on purchase. One is going to suddenly be in a position in which the negligence is treated as casting a very long shadow and embracing all the downstream consequences. It may not get so far as warranty, but in many cases it will be something not far away from it. Um, so there are, there are in, in, in our submission, my Lord's Melody, um, real issues here for, the, for, for, for departing from what is a measure of loss which has been in place since the 1950s. Well, that, that's the interorum submission. I understand <laughs> that, and I was expecting Men it at some point. Um, but there are particular... There are particular elements of the facts here which I would say were unusual. I'm not sure. I, I understand the point, but I'm not sure it necessarily means that everything that one ever knew about surveyor's negligence cases would go out of the window. I mean, I've never seen a surveyor assume in a new build property that there were things that he couldn't have known whether they were there or not. Well, my lord, I mean, it gets I mean, into the question, question of to what extent you ought to be identifying risks. I understand that. And that, that obviously was something that the judge found against my clients on the, on the, on the breach duty question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. Yes, Mr. Tavi Evans. My lords and my lady, I propose to say a number of things. Um, but given my learned friend's submissions, I may be taking them a little bit more shortly than I planned. Um, I'm going to say something by way of an introduction. Then I'm going to say something that will direct you to passages of the judgment, although a good deal of it has been covered, I think, by my learned friend already. Um, I'm going to go through the case law, but I think at some pace, because your lord, lords and uh, ladyship have already been taken to a number of the, trend, um, number of the cases. And then to comment on um, why my client wins on the grounds that this is an advice case, um, or on the grounds that um, it was an information case in the alternative, if one needs to get there. But th I start really with the introductory remarks, which was that the judge was correct. The kind of loss Mr. Large was retained to protect them against was paying too much for the property. Now, the scope of Mr. Large's duty was determined by the judge and is particular to the facts of this case. And as he essentially says in his judgment, it, it was in the end because of what emerged. It was to protect the, the hearts from the risks of all the latent defects. Now, the key point there is that actually Mr. Large had a number of tools by which he could carry this through. The first was by properly inspecting and reporting on observable defects, accepted given the limitations, um, not lifting carpets, etc., etc., by properly reporting. Secondly, uh, by properly observing and then making the appropriate recommendations <coughs> in respect of building control and others. And thirdly, had he realised and fully appreciated the position he was in and not made the assumptions he was making, by advising that obtaining a PCC was essential. Advice which the judge described at um, paragraph 252 as fundamental to whether the purchase should go ahead. In the circumstances, and to give effect, therefore, to the general compensatory principle, which Muller and a friend of myself have agreed about, is applicable. And in the context of the measure of loss being diminution in value, the actual subtrahend in this case is the true value of the property with all latent defects, its actual value. Putting it very succinctly, Muller and a friend's submission 
solutions. Overlook that there are two parts to the task that Mr Large had. One was value, but the second was giving advice about, effectively, don't purchase this property unless you've got a PCC. And what my learned friend's approach does is invite your lordships and ladyships to focus on the valuation aspect, but to give no credit and put nothing on the other part, which was the advice, don't purchase this without the PCC. And that was causative. And had that advice been given, we know from the judge's findings this transaction would never have taken place. And my clients would never have taken on all the latent defects. So is the advisory role critical then? Um, in the assessment of damage because this appears to be a case where he's not got an overall advisory role in the understand usual understandable sense in Samco. But the judge finds that he does take on an advisory role in relation to a critical part of the transaction and therefore it falls on that side of the line rather than the other. The judge does indeed. And that is my submission. Yes. But actually, as I've been working up this case for this appeal, it seems to me that the result is the same one way or the other, whether it's an advice case or an information case. Because the failure here was to tell them, give them the, that what was crucial, or if you see this as information, crucial is getting the PCC. And effectively, without it, don't proceed. From what did um, did the duty to give that advice spring? What um, what aspect of the instructions about about um, the PCC? Yes, about the PCC. Um, we had here we had here a, a, a standard home buyer report commissioned. Yes, and paid as it were. As it's a template report was was required. At a certain level, and so how, how does just I just want to understand how you put how the obligation to have made that recommendation fits with that? Um, well, I put it very much as the judge put it and found it in the judgment, which is that yes, they were instructed to carry out a home buyer's report, um, but one can see from the terms of the home buyer's report, one doesn't slavishly follow um, some some path. One has to apply thinking and understanding. And what the judge found was that when one came to the site um, and you saw that you're dealing here with a property in a very exposed location, there's been extensive reconstruction. That's uh, the judgment, I think, at page 139. But yes. Although this is a sort of quasi-new bill, there is not in place an NHBC certificate. And neither had this property um, been in existence for sufficient time for the quality of the build to be tested by living. It was as a result of those factors that the judge concluded that what they needed was um, the advice that a professional consultant certificate, an architect certificate, was essential. That's how one gets there, my lord, from the, the home buyer's report. The, the, the home buyer report um, description is for somebody who needs more expense, extensive information about buying or selling a conventional house. Um, it costs more, but it includes issues that need to be investigated to prevent serious damage or dangerous conditions, legal issues that need to be addressed before completing your conveyancing. So here we have the, the standard sort of mixture of advice and information, um, because by providing the information that these are issues, you're 
converting the purchaser to the need to take account of this. Yes, you, you are. Yes. Uh, forgive me, my lord. Yeah. I can see, Lord, you've got a bundle open. I'm trying to. Well, it was, it was simply. It, sorry, it was it was SB twenty four. Um, which, which was what, what Mr. Wilton had taken us to before, and it's in the judgment as well. Yes. Um, simply the, the characteristic of, a, of this particular standard form of report. Yes, it has a particular characteristic. Yes. Um, but this appeal is not about, if I can, undoing and unpicking the characteristics or the, or the duties no. um, of, the, of the value or the surveyor in this case. I think while your lordship has the, the bundle open, um, one can see at SB 9, page 9, that while under 1.2 care and diligence, while this is a home buyer's report and it has natural limitations, it emphasises that it's still the obligation to give the client the benefit of the surveyor's professional advice and opinion and judgment in rather than just uh, in addition to simple facts. Yeah. So you I think, I think what, what I was trying to get to was um, that um, Mr Wilson says, well, this is, this is terrible. The, um, the consequences for surveyors are in, enormous. Um, I was just wondering how, how you put it in uh, regard to um, whether actually there was a particular feature of this case which meant it wasn't just a standard home buyer's report or um, or whether actually this is what surveyors need to be doing. That's what it says on the, on the guide. Isn't it paragraph 2.4 on page 11? Sorry, my hand nearly hit me. Last paragraph. It, so um, you're getting a professional opinion as an economic price focuses on the condition and evaluating particular features yes. that affect, affect the present value. However, um, no tests are undertaken. There's a risk that you might not find certain defects that might have been uncovered if you go for the more expensive report. However, if there's a trail of suspicion, the surveyor has to take reasonable steps, and that might involve recommendation of further investigation. Now, that's classically this case. It is this so case. you start with information. Um, surveyor goes to... Um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hart and says, I'm terribly sorry, I wasn't able to investigate because it's all behind the, the plaster, um, whether there's a proper damp proofing course. Um, I would expect there to be, but I can't tell you because it would require more in, extensive in, investigation. Um, but the one thing that you really must do in order to protect yourself in case I'm wrong in my assumption is to get a PCC. No, that's exactly it. And that's, that's, and that's the, the advice part. That's, that's the advice part. It's not just the valuation, that's the advice part. And that's the... Or the recommendation, as it's put. Yes. Yeah. And the judge put it in, my lord, in, in... The judge dealt with it, I think, um, in the paragraphs um, of his judgment um, on about page 138 of the bundle, etc. Um, and going over to page 141. Yeah. And he asks the question, really based upon the particular facts of this case. Uh, if I can... He, he points out the matters that I've already mentioned, is that it's effectively new build, but without an NHB certificate. The clients don't have any um, direct contractual recourse to the builder or the architect, um, and the property has not been standing long enough to be tested. And really, therefore, he asks at page 141 of the bundle, paragraph 156 of the judgment, where does this leave me? And the answer is the surveyor has a choice. Either he can say in truth that he or she cannot say whether the property is, for example, weatherproof, or the surveyor has to dig very deep and analyse the build, structure with a considerable level of scrutiny. And then he follows this through in paragraphs 157 and 158. And at page 159, really comes to the key finding on the particular facts of this case, which are not common, but on the particular facts, that the only way the surveyor can protect the prospective purchaser is to spell out the limitation of the advice given, be particularly alert to any signs of inadequate design and faulty workmanship, which there were, and then a draw 
um, attention in appropriate terms to the protection available to the purchaser, including on the facts of this case, APCC. If I can just pick up one of my learned friends' points, there's no interorum argument here, because this is a case peculiar on its facts. We're not dealing with a standard new build where there is an NHBC case, and neither are we dealing with the usual property where the NHBC, my recollection is, lasts for about 10 years. The, the whole property has actually been lived in, and the defects have become manifest. Uh, this is I mean, a it's certainly this is certainly a very unfortunate combination of circumstances because I know it was part of Mr. Wilton's case at trial that the solicitors were negligent and the judge effectively makes that finding um, uh, and uh, uh, there really were a whole host of things that when you, and the judge is very careful not to judge it all with hindsight, but um, the fact that there is a, a building that has been largely rebuilt and the photographs that we were taking to earlier shows how new it all looks, and yet really there wasn't a shred of proper material as to what actually had gone into the house, other than a certificate of making good defects, which itself is only ever conditioned by the snagging list that prompted it. So it, it is, I mean, I think one has considerable sympathy, really, for, in that sense, for both the Hearts and Mr. Large. Mm. And I have to say that. I mean, it, 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 is, um, it is an unfortunate combination of circumstances. Lord, yes. Yeah. Lord, maybe that's convenient if I can jump ahead mm. and just mention a few points dealing with the judgment. Yes. Um, we just looked at how the judge reasoned to get to the scope of the duty that was actually owed in this particular case. Um, but if I could just pass some comments on de the defects. I do this because Mr. Wilton characterises them wrongly in my submission as minor and trivial and plays down their significance. Whereas I know my clients um, who have had to live with these defects and are watching um, do not regard them as minor at all. But I'll take this rather quickly. Um, there were defects in relation to damp proofing, which are identified at pay, paragraph 172 of the judgment. And those are admitted defects in relation to damp proofing. And then there were proven defects as well at paragraph 174, also um, in relation to damp proofing. But there were other major defects as well with the property. And if um, one takes the judgment at paragraph 176, uh, there was a lack of fire protection to steel columns and beams. And this was plainly um, apparent in the garage um, where they could be clearly seen. Um, there were defective flues, um, etc. cetera. But there were, many of them were major issues. There was a binding front door, which is paragraph 197. There were two roof defects, which is over the page, at uh, paragraph 183. Uh, there were issues with external cladding, um, at page 189, sorry, paragraph 189. And also there were issues um, with the window sill um, not being laid with a fall so that, in fact, water was holding on the windowsills and, if anything, falling back into the property. And on paragraph 197, um, there was also poor workmanship um, in relation to the, to the uh, terrace. Now, some of those were minor, but the ones I've just mentioned were also um, major. It's also true that the judge found that many of the defects were not observable, that's paragraph 158. But conversely, he also found that there were major defects which were observable, one of which is the damp proofing. And I can pick that up at paragraph 192, where he, rep he records and finds that it is clear that generally there was no evidence of damp proof membranes. Generally, this was because the walls were rendered in such a way as to make it 
impossible to see whether there were or were not such membranes. Although there were some locations where damp-proof membrane should have been visible, but was not. And at paragraph 195 and 196, um, where he accepts the submissions, particularly paragraph 37, um, and one therefore goes back to paragraph 195, um, he accepts the point is that Mr. Large should have reported that he could not see visible DPC at any relevant location and that further investigations were required, and in essence would require confirming the position with either the architects Harriston Saturn or building control. Indeed, the total absence of a DPC in this case was unusual. But other defects were also visible, and he makes mention of those in paragraphs 189 and 197. What belie what led to um, Mr. Large falling into error here was that rather actually inspecting and reporting on what he could see, he really just made a number of assumptions that everything was fine. Now, for your uh, Lordships and Ladies record, those assumptions are actually set out in the Home Buyers Report, but they have been conveniently pleaded um, by Mr. Hugh Evans who was one of the barristers involved in this case before myself, um, at page 209 of the call bundle. And one picks it up, for example, at little paragraph D at page 209. Um, where what is said, there would be a waterproof membrane, effectively speculation and assumption. And the next one, E, it is reasonable to assume. Well, that, so that things went feeds on. into the last sentence of 193 in the judge's judgment. Which was exactly the, my next paragraph. <laughs> that was exactly, it's exactly what Proving it Proving that into. we have read it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we get to where we are. Yeah. is because he made these assumptions. Now, we've looked a few moments ago at the practice note about what the surveyor could have done in these cases. And my learning friend has, has focused upon the valuation aspect rather than the advice aspect. But actually, if you should have said that a PCC is essential, and effectively don't buy without a PCC, one of the options is for the valuer was not simply to try and conjure up some hypothetical valuation figure, which is what Mr. Wilton has been pressing um, more latterly this morning. Actually, one of the things you could do is report, I can't really give a valuation at the moment um, until either certain things have been clarified, recommendations have been followed, investigations given, and or you've got a PCC. And that, to pick up um, my Lord, Lord Justice uh, Jackson's point, that is actually provided for within the HBA, in the Home Buyers Report. At um, the supplemental bundle, page 21. It's perhaps convenient just to pick it up put it in context at page 19 where we see the section is 4.7 overall opinion. Overall opinion you put in box C. But then if you go over to page 21, there are just some sample paragraphs. Price OK, but common defects. Unwide to proceed at any price. Opinion not possible. So there are a number of options open to this um, large in this matter about what he could have said. So what page was that? Just Sorry, my lord. Um, it's 21. it's uh, 21. Thank you. SB 21. No, I looked at it and I put it back without referring to the page. I, I can see how if it was a, a case where um, it fell into the unwise to proceed at any price category so that the surveyor would say um, on the basis of what I've seen, it's 
pretty dodgy. Um, and the fact that you haven't got any sort of comfort in relation to the damp proofing, etc. Um, I, I take the view that it's unwise to proceed at any price. Um, that's the counterfactual, the hypothetical, the, what he yes. would have done if, if he acted competently. Then I can see how you can make um, the surveyor responsible for all the losses, because the only competent thing he would have said is don't buy it. Um, where it, it, the competent thing that he has to do is to say, I can't give an opinion, which is this one, really, it becomes much more difficult, doesn't it, to... Well, well then you really... You're, you're, you have to separate out the value and the advice. Then you fall on to the advice is, I can't really say. And of course, we know in this case, the advice would have gone a little bit further, or very much further, and effectively say, I don't can't buy say, without... But you shouldn't buy without uh, X. Yeah, yes. Don't buy without X. Yes, these, these, are, um, these, these are not categories, they're sample, I mean, they're, they're sample paragraphs. Um, and so you say that it would have been a mixture of Yes, a couple of yeah. these would have been appropriate in this case. I, exactly. What, what I'm trying to say is that, unlike Maloney Friend, who's invited you all to focus on, he would have had to come up with a figure, and that's it. And you work out quantum solely based upon the report providing a figure. What I'm actually saying is, no, the job here was to provide a figure if you could, or caveat it, but also to provide advice. Don't purchase. Um, without a PCC. And essentially, where you say, don't purchase without a PCC, you immediately get into the causal point of that my client would ne then not have taken on any of the latent defects. Now, my learned friend is, is very keen to say that you take out of quantum, the measure of loss, any of the consequences of the actual counterfactual. And that simply can't be right. It, it's not possible to say that simply because this, in property terms, was a catastrophic event. Yes. Um, that therefore the normal principles don't apply. That's right. right. And my Lord, is that a convenient moment? Um, if it is for you, yes. Thank you. All right. We'll, we'll resume at two o'clock. All right.